Today is Earth Day, and it's helpful to remember that the answer to many sustainability problems isn't necessarily more technology. When it comes to food, electricity, water, heat, cooking, and many, many other aspects of our lives, we already have solutions that require less resources and can be created locally. We can understand these under the rubric of low-tech solutions. And while we aren't alone here with our ideas at the Institute, we're part of a larger community. And yesterday, I was lucky enough to be included on a panel to discuss low-tech innovations for sustainability problems. This is the Low Tech Podcast. Hello and welcome. I'm Scott Johnson from the Low Technology Institute, your host for podcast number 48 on April 22nd, 2022, coming to you usually out of the Low Tech Institute's gardens behind me, but it's raining today and here in Cooksville, Wisconsin. Thanks for joining us. Today we're going to be listening in to a panel discussion on low-tech innovation that was hosted by the French Embassy's Office of Science and Technology. This event will be a two-part podcast with the second half to follow next week. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at low underscore techno. Like us on Facebook, find us on Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube, and check out our website, lowtechinstitute.org. There you can find both of our podcasts as well as information about joining and supporting the Institute and its research. Also, some podcast distributors put ads on podcasts. Unless you hear me doing the ad, someone else is making money on that advertising. And this is where I usually make a short pitch for you to visit our Patreon page and support the Institute. But instead, this week, I'd like to call attention to those organizations represented in these presentations. You can find links to all of their respective organizations in the show notes. Please check them out and consider supporting them directly. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. So I am Linda Michi. I'm currently a deputy attaché for the Office of Science and Technology of the Embassy of France, uh, which is based in Washington, D.C., and in six other consulates, like the one we have here in uh, Houston, Texas. So our general mission uh, is to strengthen partnerships between uh, French and American researchers and organizations from academic or um, industrial fields and facilitate the transfer from technology, um, from research to industry. So energetic transition and solutions for climate change are one of the priorities we lead at our office. And uh, so for this reason, and for in the context of celebration of Earth, Earth Day, we organized this event about the promising topic of low-tech innovation as a vigorous action needed for a sustainable environment. So this conversation is composed of two parts and we feature speakers from both the USA and France in various fields. So um, it will be moderated by Libby Xu, Associate Director of Academics at the MIT lab located in Boston and a specialist in um, of sanitation and water treatment. Uh, just to mention it quickly, the q and session is dedicated at the end of, um, of each part, and you may ask questions in the chat in the meantime. And one last detail, this event will be recorded, and uh, so if you cannot attend the whole event or if you want to share it with, uh, with your colleagues who, who are not here, don't worry, it will be shared with you um, afterwards. So without further ado, I will give the floor now to Libby, uh, who will introduce the speakers and what is the session. So enjoy. Thank you so much, Linda. Hello, everyone. Bienvenue and welcome and happy Earth Day. Um, the term low tech can be surprising to hear at an event hosted by a science and technology office, uh, let alone in the context of climate change. The 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, which are promoted by the United Nations, provide a blueprint for peace and prosperity around the world that includes ambitious targets for innovation and for R&D. So you might be thinking, well, climate change is a pretty complex problem. Shouldn't we be marshalling our most cutting edge high tech resources to address the consequences of climate change being faced by people and societies around the world? Well, the group of experts assembled here today is, are looking at these issues from a very different lens. And they challenge you today to adopt this lens in your own thinking. Our panelists disagree with the idea that innovation has to follow a high tech path that may be using expensive resources and infrastructure. Instead, they apply the principles of low tech innovation to achieve sustainable solutions to climate change. And they recognize that there are billions of humans who have lived on earth who have already identified many technological solutions to the questions we're asking ourselves about climate change. If only we can amplify those ideas and spread them to where they're needed. So we're gonna be talking about low tech today. And just to share my screen for a moment, the, the definition for low tech that we're using to frame today's conversation is based on three overarching principles. 
of sustainability, resilience, and transformation. So strong sustainability refers to these principles of efficiency, simplicity, durability that can be leveraged during the design process to create environmentally responsible solutions. Um, collective resilience refers to finding solutions that are easy to use, that are easy to maintain, and that are made with local materials to ensure that they're available to everyone who needs them. And the concept of cultural transformation pushes us to explore the context of technology in societies around the world and empower individuals while also contributing to societal health. So as you can see, all of these principles are intertwined. Keep this image in mind um, because a thoughtful creator or disseminator of technology is considering them together. And this graphic that you see is certainly not the only way to define low tech. You'll discover other thinkers who are using terms like frugal innovation or humble technology um, to describe these same approaches to innovation. So today you're gonna to hear from creative thinkers who are based in France and the United States who have traversed the world listening to and learning from diverse cultures as they seek to answer these scientific and engineering questions about climate change and adhering to the principles of low tech. Um, so they're thinking hard about the process of technology creation and how it can be more inclusive and uh, not just the end product because they believe that the process is also as important as the, as the, as the outcome. Um, so we're so thrilled to see all of you here today and we look forward to an excellent conversation. Um, you can type your questions in the chat and we will um, answer some of them during the Q&A sessions. Our first set of four speakers is gonna dive into this question of why low tech? Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our first panelist, Philippe Bui, General Director of Management, Research and Interchange. The acronym in French is AREP. So Philippe, please take it away. Yes, thank you very much, Libby. I hope you are hearing me well. I am not in uh, super conditions in terms of network, but it seems that the high tech will, will help us today to communicate a little bit. And I apologize for, for my poor English or, or American. But so uh, I will try to share my screen. I think you should have it more or less now, or it's coming, I would say. Okay, maybe it's okay. You, you can see my screen now. Yes. Everything. Yes, super. Okay, so let's go for it. So I have a very uh, difficult task, I think, to, to, to be the first speaker and to, to try to, to dive into this uh, low tech uh, um, introduction or, or low tech definition. And I think that there are as many definitions of low tech as, as, uh, as uh, there are uh, speakers or people uh, talking about it. So, so anyway, I will give you my, my own feeling, but it's also the richness, I think, of this uh, alternatives into innovation that, uh, that, that create really the, the uh, interesting uh, discussions. So, uh, basically, I have just a few slides. Uh, one is about why, why low tech, uh, and, and then about what, what is low tech. And I think that I have about ten slides. So, Linda, in case uh, uh, I'm still on the on the why after five or seven minutes, you can shut me down. So let's go for it. Uh, I think there are uh, a few elements. Basically, let's say three, four uh, big reasons from my point of view why the high tech promises are not so great and not only to address actually climate change in terms of uh, of reduction of, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions or even adaptation it's also the question of, of resources biodiversity i think it's not about just addressing climate change but in a in a broader way the, the question of the high-tech promises like we can let's say go forever with the green growth and have electric cars and and smart cities and, and smart objects that will help us to be more and more efficient and, and consume less and less uh, uh, energy and and, and, and be in, in a kind of a zero co2 world that would be more or less the same as today but with better um, uh, solutions and, and and there has been so many progresses we have to admit that okay the the, the chemistry of batteries, the, the, the type of, of uh, the materials we have developed, lighter, and so on and so on, gives us the idea that we can still uh, struggle uh, with any kind of, of uh, challenge and, and be able to overcome it the same way the humanity has done it in the past. But in fact, there are a few elements that should make us very, very prudent with these promises. The first one is the fact that these high-tech solutions are consuming more and more resources 
non-renewable resources, especially metal resources, about 60 different metals that we're introducing in all our, let's say, uh, batteries, renewable energies, uh, electronics, uh, IT solutions, etc. And I think that about 10 years ago, nobody was really speaking about that. I think that now, especially with the COVID-19 crisis and some some stops in the in the value chains uh, at the world level, but also with the events uh, in Ukraine nowadays, it's, it's it's also putting on the top of the of the questions this consumption of resources. And there are there has been I've put here a few a few uh, let's say resource uh, elements possible that International Energy Agency, the the OECD, the World Bank, everybody now is pointing the fact that we are going to make a gigantic extraction of resources to be able to feed uh, the, the, the transition towards uh, renewable energies and towards a more digital world. And it's sometimes when I say gigantic, it's something like times five, times 10, sometimes times 30, times 50, uh, the, the, the quantity of, uh, I don't know, lithium, cobalt, nickel, many other metals, copper, that we will need to extract in the next decades to feed this transition. So this is this the first challenge. The second challenge is that once we have extracted these resources, we should be able to say, okay, guys, keep cool. We can, we have extracted very much, but then we can just make the circular economy. We can recycle all these metals. Problem is that the, the products that we are conceiving, that we are defining, and especially the electronic products, but not only, they are more and more difficult to recycle it's quite easy to understand, right? Because if you put something like 40 different metals in just in a smart smartphone, 40 different metals, sometimes just one milligram or even less, then it's very difficult at the end of the of the utilization of the of the smartphone to really recycle everything. We are engineers are very strong, are very uh, are very smart and clever, but not as much as being able to extract and separate and split up to 40 different metals in so many and small quantities. And the, the proof of this is that about half of the metals today, something like 30 different metals on the total of the 60 metals we're using, they are today recycled at the rate of zero. Less than 1% say scientific people because they are prudent, but it's something like zero. So the more we are introducing high tech in our objects, in our buildings, in our infrastructure, in our daily life, let's say, the more resources we need, sometimes rarer, and and the, and, and, and the, the, the more difficult to, to, to recycle everything. The third point about high-tech promises is that, of course, we are defining, designing, or Im imagining so a world where everything would be much more efficient, like smart grids to be able to exchange uh, electrons between uh, uh, renewable re producers, renewable energy producers and consumers. We imagine smart cities, we imagine uh, smart uh, cars, uh, autonomous vehicles that will be able to, to reduce at the end the number of, of cars because we will be able to make much more car sharing very easily, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is that to install this and to make this gains in terms of environment footprint, we also need to install a, another word, which is a digital word with very, uh, 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 let's say, uh, consuming uh, 5G or 6G uh, networks, telecommunication networks and data centers to uh, store all this, uh, uh, all this data and to be able to make the calculations and so on and so on in a very, of course, everything in real time. And all this is consuming, of course, uh, also energy and resources. And the problem is that we don't know really the balance. We know that we are consuming more to be able to install the, the digital world or to increase the digital world. But then we don't really know what we are going to save with these autonomous cars that will come maybe in 2030. So there is a problem here. And you know that the digital system, if you include manufacturing, if you include powering and cooling the data centers and, and your computers at home and so on. All this is already consuming something like 10% of the electricity worldwide. And it's something like the greenhouse uh, uh, gas emissions from more than the, more than the uh, that uh, transport by, by air. So it's really something quite big. It's like 1 billion tons of CO2 per year. So this is what we are installing and we don't really know how we are going to use it. And the very last point, regarding the limits of high tech is the, uh, the fact that 
there is also the rebound effect that's something coming from the 19th century that every time we make something more efficient a product more efficient or service more efficient consuming less energy consuming less resources then it is it is cheaper and if it's cheaper we use it more and economists know, know very well this uh, story so that means that today the the, the, the aircraft engines are much more efficient than 20 years ago, no problem. So every passenger is consuming less. But the problem is that, of course, there are much more passengers. Same for uh, IT system. Every, uh, every byte of information is, co is consuming less and less to be stored in the data center or to be transported into the networks. But at the end, there are much more, uh, much more bytes to be transported and much more bytes that are created and stored everywhere. So this rebound effect is limited the, the real capacity to catch the efficiency, the technical efficiency that we are doing, and, and it's it's not really materializing into, into the real world. So what would be high-tech and, and low-tech then? Then low-tech for me is just, at, at the beginning was just a provocation against high-tech to say, hey, it's, be careful because high-tech promises are not so great. And by the way, I would say that if you take the sanitary crisis, COVID-19, of course, there has been a very high-tech response, which was, of course, the, the, the vaccines that have been developed so rapidly. And, and maybe you remember at the beginning, there were some robots cleaning the streets in China, some drones delivering food at home, and it was a very high-tech response. But at the end, 99% of the response of humanity has been just very low-tech, uh, awfully low-tech, I would agree, in this case. But it was about the behavior, like uh, coughing in, into the, the, the in, to your elbow and staying at home and not not seeing people and uh, etc. But it was it was really low tech, and I think the resilience, you know, this this capacity to to answer to any perturbation uh, uh, was really for me the complementary of high tech and low tech. So this is something that maybe should inspire us for for future. So for me, low tech is is difficult to define because I think an object can never really be low tech. Like a bike could be low tech, but even a bike is it comes from very high tech uh, uh, industries. I right? mean, just to make the cables for the brakes, and this is very complex complex object. So so for me, it's more about an approach, and the approach should be. Uh, to, to ask basically three questions, why, what, and how. Why should I produce something? What should I produce and how? So the first question, of course, is the, the question of the why. Why should I produce it? So it, it's about the question of sufficiency, of frugality, we could say. What, what do I need at the end? Because of course, every time I will produce something, I know the recycling rate will not be perfect, so I will waste some resources for future generations. So. What, what should we do really? And should we try to focus the resources, the precious resources where they are really necessary? So we can imagine that in the cars, we could of course go biking, but every we cannot all go biking tomorrow because the cities have been transformed around the cars, but we could do lighter cars, less powerful vehicles. We could reduce the speed limit and to make smaller and smaller cars that would at the end more or less deliver the service and would really reduce the greenhouse gas emissions almost immediately, very easily. In the buildings, we could build less. We have so many uh, buildings already, already in place that we don't use so well, actually. Sometimes because they are underoccupied, sometimes because we could share some, 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 uh, some functions and maybe the schools can also become the, the clubs in the night. I don't know, you can imagine everything you want to increase, intensify the, 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 the utilization of the, of, of the buildings. And you can, of course, also, uh, lower the heating or the have no air conditioning of course I have a better insulation but you can also just say that you will you will heat less and, and insulate the bodies instead of insulating uh, the, the, the building so you can imagine many things in consumer goods you can ban disposable objects make reusable packaging many many innovation about this uh, nowadays in, in France for instance uh, internet internet of course you could reduce the video or reduce the, the definition of the videos, use less the videos and, uh, and um, the data transfer in, in mobility because it's very costly. Uh, it's easier with cables if you want to have, a, you know, to, to download a, a film or movie, etc., etc. So we can imagine many things uh, uh, to, to, to have a kind of sufficiency approach. Once you have said that, mm, I may I may keep the washing machine because okay, I don't want to <laughs> to avoid the washing machine. Then you come to the second question, which 
which is the, the what, what sh shall I conceive, which type of object. And here, I think it's, it's really a play field for, for engineers, for technicians, for, for many people to, to try to build repairable, modular, reusable objects, easy to dismantle at the end when, when they will be at their, their end of life, uh, privilege the, the, the robustness, the simplicity, a single material approach. Every time you, you mix different materials, I think this comes to the, to the smartphone example I was giving uh, before, try to avoid some kind of metal incompatibilities, um, alloys incompatibilities, and as much as possible reduce electronics because electronics is, is generally a nightmare uh, when you come to the recycling. So here, I think you will have plenty of examples with, uh, with other panelists for sure. And the last question is the, the, the how, I would say, that what, how should I produce? And here, it opens also questions regarding the type of production. Should I go in very big factories, gigafactories, or what do I have? Can I have other approaches? Not for everything, of course. I think you need for to steel for steel production for a, a refinery. I don't know. You need a kind of a certain scale, of course. We don't imagine that some people will come and uh, and produce uh, steel in every village, like in the Middle Ages. That's not the question. But for many types, other types of of production, like let's say daily objects, tooling, etc. Mm, uh, uh, yes, many many types of things you, you can use in a daily in a daily basis. This could be built into, let's say, smaller factories, very close to the production, to the, to the consumption uh, markets. And, um, and also it, it opens the question of the place of the machines, because of course, it's very practical to replace a, a, a human by a machine, because it will work very well. It will not go on strike, super. It, it, it can work at night and a, and a day. Yes, sure, but it's also consuming uh, resources. So today we're, let's say, facing it's a new promise of transforming intellectual work into data center work with, I don't know, lawyers that will become uh, based on, on machine learning and so on and so on. But this is also replacing uh, uh, renewable resources, which are humans, by, by consumption of machines. So this is something we should think about and, and have a kind of uh, techno discernment or technological discernment that is to say, Okay, let's put machines where they are really necessary. For instance, in hospitals, every, by the dentist, everything you want, but maybe not just to, to be at home with a refrigerator, uh, just shopping for you on internet. And this is where we should, we should think about the usefulness and I think the utility of, of what we are designing. And I think something that will, uh, I think for, for, for many people, uh, at least I know at least some panelists, it's a very important um, criteria. Uh, a criterion to 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 define uh, low tech. So that's I think I've got done my 10 15 minutes and I'm still uh, there. So Linda, I think you you have kept me the time. So let's say that yes, to go to a kind of uh, of uh, yes sustainable uh, civilizations from a technical point of view, resource point of view, and to to be able to address the challenges we have, I think that we need to orient. It's not about ban uh, banishing innovation or even technical innovation. But I think it's just to say, let's put innovation with a certain goal. And this goal should be the reduction of the environmental footprint, should be the resilience. And we are far from that. Look at uh, the tens of thousands of engineers that, that uh, Mark Zuckerberg is hiring now to make the, meta, the metaverse world, I think, which is just something crazy that we don't really need to be happy, I think. And, and by the way, we'll not save anything, including the planet, but we consume for sure many many data and, and uh, even if there are some some progress and technical steps in, in the way the data centers are consuming energy so i think this is something what, that we should think about that we have a kind of uh, let's raise the right questions just not designing something just because i can sell it no we should think about the usefulness we should think about the goals and think that innovation is something else than just technical innovation it can be organizational cultural innovation for example for example just having let's say empty uh, cleaning empty bottles and and and, and putting new, uh, new new stuff into into the bottle is something that is has no technical challenge for that i mean cleaning a bottle is very easy but just putting people together consumers producers and logistic chain storing etc all this then becomes quite complex and then that means that the solutions we should develop as engineers and as, as uh, everybody, as marketers and so on, 
we should develop socio-technical solutions, not technical solutions. I think the behavior, having people on board will be very important. And this is, I think, what, what low-tech low DNA is more or less. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philippe, for that excellent introduction and for posing those three questions to us um, to think about as we um, continue discussing low-tech. So uh, without further ado, we'll move on to our next speaker, Corentin de Chateau-Peron. Uh, who is the co-founder of the Low Tech Lab and is speaking to us from outside New York. Thank you yeah. so much. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. And uh, okay, thank you, Linda, for the presentation. So yeah, I'm a member of the Low Tech Lab, which is a nonprofit, a French organization. And the goal of the Low Tech Lab is to find low tech innovation, to test them, to document and promote them so that anyone can replicate them. The idea is to focus on local entrepreneurship so that people all around the world can take those knowledge and uh, adapt them to their local economy, to their local culture with the, the, their local means and resources and everything. And um, yeah, we want to, our definition is as you said, uh, Linda, on what explained Philippe, it's, we use exactly the same, and we condense it into three words, uh, useful, accessible, and sustainable. And so um, we started our uh, next, uh, next one, Linda, please. Thanks. We started in 2013 uh, by creating a website, which is a kind of uh, wiki. That means it's open source and collaborative, and there are tutorials on it, on each technology that we document. There are like something like 150 different technologies or know-hows. Uh, it's called lowtechlab.org, if you want to have a look. And uh, in 2016, uh, next slide, please, Linda. Uh, we started a journey around the world, uh, with this boat, it's a kind of floating laboratory. Uh, we are now on board with uh, close to New York and we'll cross soon the Atlantic Ocean to go back to France. And we started in 2016 and we've been in 25 countries uh, and, and documented more than 50 different low tech. Uh, so I, I won't explain the 50 low tech that we found, <laughs> it would be too long, but uh, I have selected three examples. Uh, next one in Dublin. Um, one of my favorites was the black soldier fly. Uh, it was, we studied that in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur. It's a fly that is really incredible because uh, the larvae of this fly can transform very efficiently organic waste into fertilizer and we can harvest the, the larvae to feed animals. And they were using it at a quite large scale in Kuala Lumpur. They were transforming 300 tons of waste, organic waste every day uh, into fertilizer to grow food and also to feed some fish with the larvae. And it's good for different issues, the waste management, uh, because the organic waste are burnt or um, put with other kinds of waste in the, in the ground. So thanks to those larvae, it's, it, it makes two uh, resources, one side the fertilizer and the other side the, the food. And another issue is that feeding fish or chicken with those larvae, avoid to overfish in the Bay of Bengal over there. And also it creates a local economy. So it's a good example also of low tech we discovered because you can spread the knowledge at a small scale. We even have on board on the boat, um, a small uh, black soldier fly, a fly uh, farm to treat a very small quantity of organic waste, but you can do it at large scale. So it's good for local entrepreneurs that can start with just a few dollars a farm and then raise it. And uh, other example, Linda, can you 
put the next slide, was the biodigester. This one was in Nicaragua, but we also found biodigester in many countries, like uh, in France, in Brazil, in South Africa, in Madagascar, in India, in Cuba, in, yeah, that was in Nicaragua. And it also transforms organic waste, but it makes gas for like cooking gas, and so energy and also a fertilizer. And it's a combination, um, I mean, a collaboration with nat nature because it uses bacteria and microorganisms to produce the, the gas. And the next slide, Linda. Um, oh, yeah. This is, um, it, it was in Cuba about communication. Um, over there, they don't have uh, easy access to the internet. It's quite expensive. It's not affordable. So they, they made quite huge uh, local networks. It's intranet. That means they install antennas and people can send data. Like if you send um, uh, an email, uh, a picture to someone, like uh, if you want to send it uh, in France uh, to your neighbor, it will go to your data center, uh, to the data center of your uh, email, uh, I don't know, uh, host or something. And then it will be downloaded to another data center of the email provider of your neighbor. And then it will be downloaded to the computer of your neighbor. Thanks to this kind of antenna that they install in Cuba, um, they, you, you can directly send it uh, through this antenna to your neighbor. And so next, uh, those are only three examples, but so we, we met many people on many solutions. We documented many solutions around the world. And um, at the end of the tour, and I was trying to find uh, in a few words what we learned during this tour about all those low tech. Uh, and uh, I found four things. So next, uh, next slide, Linda, please. The first one is uh, that we are more and more convinced that it's good to focus on local entrepreneurship and just spread the knowledge because it's much more resilient and sustainable to do like that because people can adapt the knowledge uh, and implement the technology regarding their own culture and economy and way of life and everything. And it's much more resilient. Uh, number two is the next slide. Um, yeah, it's again the <laughs> I like this this display. <laughs> um, with I'm a mechanical engineer and I didn't know anything about nature before uh, starting this journey, and I found that collaborations with nature, like this larvae, but also with the microorganism, with the mushrooms, with vegetables, with uh, many living things are much more efficient than made uh, man-made machines. And so we should reinforce our links with uh, nature if we want to keep the uh, low-tech philosophy in our progress. And which is not actually reinforcing our links with nature is not really the, um, the current trend. And number three is the, the next slide. Um, one of the main obstacles of the low tech we found uh, is they are not very well designed and they are not very convenient. And this is a picture about uh, the movie about the, the first computers. And it reminds me actually the first computer because we see in each of those low tech a huge potential but most of them are made by geeks in their garage and they, we have to work a lot uh, on designing them and making them more convenient. And the next slide, Linda, please, is uh, it's not a low tech picture, <laughs> but meaning that, as I don't know who said that, but, but uh, it, it's, it's smart, I think that present is the consequence of the future. Actually, the way we imagine our future has a huge impact on our everyday decisions. And so if we want that people adapt low-tech, I think we have to design a real low-tech future. 
uh, that is not like this picture, <laughs> but I mean, it's much more than a technical challenge. It's also designing a way of life, a philosophy around it. And that can drive people to adapt low tech. And I think for the moment, it's more like a bit too much geeks in their garage. <laughs> and so we, I think we, we need to, to evolve in that. That's all I learned <laughs> in, in uh, to be short. <laughs> what a great ending. Thank you so much, Pontan, and thank you for, for sharing your uh, just a slice of your amazing travels with us. Um, it's Thanks. fascinating. <laughs> um, our next panelist is Scott Johnson, um, co-founder and director of the Low Tech Institute in Wisconsin, moving across the Atlantic to the US. Hi, thank you. Let me share my screen here. One second, folks. All right, should be sharing? Yes? Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for having me uh, on this discussion today. And I realize in such a short time, none of us can really get too deep into detail of all the work we're doing. And I feel like we're just scratching the surface. So today I'm gonna to talk about food, which for me is one of the most important legs of the stool that supports complex societies. Um, the French Revolution, because French embassy, uh, will remember coincided with a wheat crisis. So food is very, very important for everything we're talking about. And with this group, I don't have to go into detail to describe how dependent our modern agricultural system is on fossil fuels and long distance transportation. Um, I don't need to say how it decreases our resilience in the face of unexpected catastrophes, uh, both man-made and natural and that governments have no realistic plans for large scale transitions. So today I'm gonna to talk about ideas to encourage redundant, resilient regional food systems. Um, that is small scale transitions and that's plural transitions because there's lots of different options we could use. Um, the truth is we've lived in a very unusual historical period. Um, few of us have known food insecurity on a national scale. And while this is truly lucky for all of us, uh, it makes our societies susceptible to hubris when it comes to food. We don't think that famine could happen to us. So many large nations have gotten rid of their strategic grain supplies. For example, in the United States, we sold our strategic grain reserve under Reagan. The idea was to put the money in the stock market, thinking that during a time of famine, we could just buy more food from somewhere else. <laughs> I tried to come up with a polite way to say that this is idiotic, but it's just so stupid, I, I can't wrap my mind around it. This is hubris on an international scale. And so I run the Low Technology Institute, which is a research and education nonprofit uh, in the United States. And our guiding principle is that fossil fuels are a finite resource and we should plan for their end as soon as possible. Uh, in the case of oil, we're talking 25 years of usable reserves. There's more, but we're not gonna dig it all out. This change then is coming in our lifetimes. And this is gonna radically change how we transport people and goods around the globe. It'll radically reduce the amount of fertilizer for crops and it will radically reduce the motive power, the tractors and things in agriculture. And so we advocate for people to build locally redundant systems into their lives now so they're able to transition smoothly to a future without fossil fuels. And we talk about this for not just food, energy, construction methods and materials, clothing, everything else we need to thrive today in our lives. And right now I'm gonna outline briefly what we've been discussing as one viable way for future communities to feed themselves. It's not the only one, but it's kind of what we've been talking about. And I'm gonna focus on why things need to be local, seasonal, and personal. Um, and for me, it all comes down to redundant, resilient and above all local systems. If you source your staple food from farther away than you can walk or ride a bicycle or a horse, you are dependent on external transportation for your food. Um, and maybe, maybe we'll be able to electrify the transportation networks to such a point that local food is indeed redundant. But until that system has been in place and well tested through natural and other disasters for many years, I'm not gonna risk the health and food of my family and community on this new system. And that means people have to start growing more food personally. And I found this great French uh, postcard of uh, the future of agriculture. Um, <laughs> I was an archeologist once upon a time. And so I often look to the past. And I know that in past societies, 90% of humans living in sedentary societies were full-time food producers, peasants and farmers. 
Only a tenth of society was able to get by on crafts and administrative work. And I don't think we have to go back to this type of severe ratio of farmers to uh, craftspeople because our understanding of the natural world and agricultural science in particular have advanced, but we would be able to feed ourselves and maintain a complex economy if most adults were to split their time evenly between skilled labor and home food production and provision. And that doesn't just include growing the food, but also preserving it and cooking it. Again, that's adults working maybe 20 hours a week in food production, preservation and preparation and 20 hours in a skilled trade. And if you think about it, that's kind of what we used to do. We used to have one person working out of the house and one person working at home. Um, this split is not impossible for a, a high functioning economy. Um, and I know this division would work uh, because we tried it, uh, we did it. Uh, in January, 2020, before we knew that COVID would become a worldwide pandemic, we decided to see if we could grow all our own food uh, locally and without fossil fuels. Um, we chronicled it all on our uh, YouTube page, also on our website. You can find that under Food Mageddon. Uh, my wife worked 40 hours a week and I grew all of our food. Um, and in that year, I was able to grow all of our food for an entire year in less than 40 hours a week. And while this is only a simulation, uh, it provides a lot of useful data and it's anecdotal, but it's still data. Um, and it also let me check out the uh, opinions and theoretical constructs I had been talking about for so long and put them into practice. Um, and so it would be entirely possible uh, to spend your morning working on a skilled trade. And I ran my nonprofit in the mornings and in the afternoons, I would grow food. And we did this on a small plot. We don't live on a large, you know, we live in the country, but we live in a pretty tight uh, community. And so uh, we don't have 20 acres to do this. Uh, our entire property is only three quarters of an acre uh, with an additional half acre next door. The total land under cultivation is less than three quarters of an acre or three uh, tenths of a hectare. And on that plot, we grew everything from wheat, rye, potatoes, corn, and oats as our staple crops. And we also grew a lot of our typical garden plants to make our food more exciting to eat. Warm tomato soup in the middle of a Wisconsin winter is a really great way to end your day. And we were able to grow much of this food without mechanization and using less of our time than you might think. Uh, we grew more than a million calories in a year. And we actually grew a lot more than that. Um, we didn't know what was gonna happen with COVID. So we actually grew uh, thousands of pounds of potatoes because we didn't know if we'd have to be giving them to our neighbors in the fall. We ended up giving them to a food pantry, but the easy ability for us to produce such a large amount of food in such a small amount of time and space speaks to the underutilized resource that is um, a lot of the, the space around us. Uh, even in a suburban American neighborhood, which you think is very unsustainable, they have a lot of space around them. They could be growing a lot of food to support themselves. Um, this type of food production is only possible if we have the right variety of plants uh, available and meals also to reflect the seasonality of our planet. Uh, my first year harvesting wheat, for example, was done using varieties created for industrial production. And they didn't really lend themselves to hand harvesting. I learned that the hard way. Um, and furthermore, the, the wheat that came out of these varieties had a really high bran content. And so it wasn't very good for making flour. Um, since then, I've adopted heritage wheat and other heirloom varieties that not only breed true, but were developed at a time when heavy fertilizer additions were not available. If you're uh, familiar with the open source seed initiative, uh, one of the things they're into is uh, just like open source software, um, being uh, able to share seeds that are reproduce uh, without, uh, they're non-hybrid seeds uh, that if you share them, you have to promise that you will let anyone else breed them and share them as well. Um, and home production lends itself to seasonal eating. Uh, without long distance transport, we're relying on fresh foods in the summer and fall and stored foods in the winter and spring. And they say in English, uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And at this point in the year, uh, we're almost out of potatoes, which is good because we eat potatoes almost every other day or every day and I need a break. Um, but by the fall, I'm going to be excited to eat potatoes again, uh, just like I'm excited to eat lettuce now, even though by the end of the summer, I'll be sick of it. Seasonal eating uh, keeps things exciting. Another thing to consider is the learning curve. Um, it's taken me 
many years uh, to figure out how to feed our family from our plot. And we cannot wait um, until we're facing a crisis to try and start doing this. Um, we can't wait until we're transitioning away from fossil fuels and long distance transportation of our staple crops. If we wait and face a crisis, it is too late. Uh, we have to start to plan and build redundant systems now. Uh, for example, this fall, I anticipate the wheat market's going to be severely disrupted by the embargo on Russian wheat and the destruction of the Ukrainian wheat harvest, which is 15% of global wheat. Um, not to mention the loss of Russian and Belarusian fertilizers on the international market, which is causing problems already with this year's crop. Uh, by growing staples at a local level, we create redundant systems. Uh, and in English, we have the saying, uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And this means to spread out your risk, uh, to avoid losing everything when you drop that basket. Um, and by having diverse dispersed agriculture, um, failure in one locality doesn't spell disaster for everyone. Redundant systems, though, are not economically advantageous. And I don't know about you, uh, but I can't eat economic advantage. Uh, every year, there's more evidence and more reason to think about transitioning and building more redundant and therefore more resilient systems locally now. Um, and I do realize I'm getting to the end here, so I want to end with this thought. Um, nobody is self-sufficient. And I'm trying to stop using that phrase. Uh, a friend of mine, Bill Robichard, pointed out to me, he's more poetic than I am, uh, nobody is self-sufficient. We all depend on one another and healthy ecosystems around us. Uh, in the future, we're going to have to depend more heavily on local communities. Um, and it's not only important to be able to do these things for yourself and your family, but also to support those around you and show them how. And now is the time. Now is the time to convince and show other people around you that this way of life with local personally grown food is not only possible, but it's, it's better. It's attractive. We grow most of our food in less time than most people think. They see my garden, they say, geez, how much time do you spend? It's, it's a few hours a day, if that. And we eat really well because we have the luxury of being able to make it all at home. We don't have to worry about paying a premium for organic or other eco, uh, ecologically friendly farming practices. It's built into our system because we don't use fossil fuels. Sometimes uh, we feel really alone when we say these things. So it's nice to hear from other folks on this panel singing in the same choir, uh, even if we are far apart. Um, but finally, I do want to point out that we need to think carefully about those who don't agree with our approach, because we can convince you know a few people here and there, but we need to get a societal change happening. And there's a lot of people in our societies that uh, willfully disregard the fact that we're facing a real problem and it's coming sooner than I think most people understand. Um, so uh, with that, I'll end and, and thank you so much for your attention. And I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone else uh, has to say and share. So let me stop sharing. Okay. Thank you so much, Scott. That was um, a fascinating presentation. And thank you for teaching us the term food Mageddon. That will certainly stick yeah. in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks for sharing your, uh, your remarkable thanks. experiment with us. Thanks. We have a, a lot of questions coming in. We're going to have one more speaker, um, and then we'll take about 10 minutes um, to discuss some questions. So our last speaker for this first set, for this first hour, is Cedric Carl of Atelier 21, uh, the, the founder and director um, of this organization in France. Go right ahead. Hi. Thank you, Libby. Thank you, everybody, for the invitation. Do you hear me well? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> yeah, you hear me. Okay, okay, great. So um, I'm the director of uh, Atelier 21. Uh, Atelier 21 is an NGO that is working on energy transition for a long time. And because we was looking for a long time about energy transition, about climate chaos versus resources, uh, we we find out that there was a lot of uh, forgotten patterns um uh, in the history that was just sleeping and uh, we decided in 2015 uh before the cop 21 in paris to uh, to make a website uh and to uh, to uh, make crowd sourcing with a, with a lot of people um expert and non experts to find out uh, all these patterns about uh, um i mean energy uses 
and also food, water, um, mobility, and not only focusing on energy production as electricity or force. Uh, so um, the goal of the project is to identify past and present frugal innovation, uh, forgotten patents, and to put them uh, in in um, in the in the for the public, for the engineers, for the energy makers and transitioners. So. Um, uh, the Paleo Energetic is, uh, uh, is already five years of, of research and uh, many inventions uh, exhumated. There is a volunteers and participant. Uh, it's already translated in uh, five languages, uh, as so, so Arabic and Japanese, uh, Spanish. Um, we have um, a great researcher around us that is um, working with us. And also we like to work with retired people uh, because they have a lot of knowledge, they have time, they have money, they are connected. So more and more, we try to connect retired people around us to work with us on this topic. And uh, here you can see the, the website um, is paleoenergetic.org. Uh, I think my, my friend can share it in the in the in the chat, and um, we find out a lot of crazy invention, uh, old techniques uh, that is uh, that is already in public domain for a long time, and public domain means open source, and public domain mean uh, also that uh, it's it's belonging to everybody, so. Um, here you can see the solar printer of uh, Augustin Mouchot that is working as a, as a pioneer of uh, solar energy, of uh, solar concentration energy. Um, uh, we got this uh, first Porsche was electric also. So uh, to, 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 um, uh, to say like Corentin, we need narratives. And the, this project is a narrative that is showing that we are facing a big problem, uh, climate chaos, resources problem, no uh, Ukrainian war, and, uh, and we have solution already. So we don't have to wait for another technology. So it's a positive narrative that it is possible because we have no uh, so fab labs. Um, we can share a lot. We have um, mechanical engineers and we are not like, opposing, um, uh, making opposition between high tech and low tech. We are facing an issue that is, uh, uh, that, that is putting uh, our uh, society in danger. So we have to answer quickly and the low tech, uh, the retro tech, the public domain can be a response to that. Perhaps there will be also an high tech coming for batteries, I don't know. But uh, we have to also take uh, uh, low tech and open source uh, in the in the ground. So um, we we are thinking also that we have to develop uh, a business model uh, based on open source and based on uh, uh, public domain, because it's a key to develop and to scale the the the, the all this network of of knowledge. And sometimes our uh, capitalistic uh, world is not able to take this open source patent because they say, yeah, I, oh, can I do money with open source? It's not possible. So after five years of research, we think that we need a, a, a workshop about uh, open source economic model and to, 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 to scale. And uh, one of our, of, of our uh, uh, economic model uh, of us is to sell our books in French, in Japanese, and now in, in, in English. In English, it's called Retrotech and Low Tech. Uh, all forgotten patents can shake the future because we think uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Pandora box uh, uh, in energy, but in water. Also, we are thinking already to make a Paleo H2O. Uh, because in water resources, we have so much problem that we have to exhumate it, uh, a, a lot of uh, resources and, uh, and patents. So, um, of course, the idea is to, to talk with the people and to not 
make a war between low tech and high tech because this is not constructive. We need to have a consensus on technology. We need to make techno critics. We need techno ethics, but we don't need to have two, uh, two a sort of uh, team, uh, the, the team with the low tech, the team with the high tech and the people, they, they make a war uh, all together. So, so uh, uh, also the, the, we have to critique, of course, innovation. Uh, we have to uh, accelerate low tech innovation if we can. So that's the goal of the project. And the project is a transmedia project. So there is the website. But also we have a, a timeline, a low tech timeline that we can put in the for workshop uh, and we, we ask the people to participate. We have different uh, uh, paper, white paper is an uh, old invention, uh, green paper is what we are doing now, uh, is an uh, ongoing project, a red paper is a, 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 um, a bad ideas. So you, you know we are sharing best practices, but Baddest practices we are not sharing it, but we have to blacklist some practice. So now we make this uh, red uh, paper, and the yellow paper is what we can do in a in a future, in the but in a quick future because uh, as the Sheikh told, uh, we have three years to make something for the climate, so we have to accelerate. So and to accelerate, we have to to have a goal, we have to have a schedule. So. The, the project is also, we use the timeline and we use the schedule to 220 to 250, and we can um, make some step and write some step. So uh, for example, we, we got a consulting um, two weeks ago about uh, GRDF, that is a, a big uh, a gas logistic uh, company in France. And that uh, we, we have this project, I, I, I hope it will happen, that uh, we have to, to see into the data of the, of the patents. So the project is to, to put the people on the, uh, on the table, to put us, to put a GRDF and to put experts and to scan in the patent office, what is about biogas, what is about uh, uh, low-tech hydrogen, and what is about like uh, what we can do with the gas, okay? So uh, with the Ukrainian situation, the, the situation is now a real crisis. It's not perhaps we have a risk of uh, missing energy or something, but no, it's the, it's the point. Uh, our agriculture is, uh, is, um, is, uh, is under attack and, uh, and um, the resources, electricity here in France, and to uh, to warm the hospital and everything. Is, uh, this is a real topic for for Europe now, because of the gas and the petrol uh, coming from Russia. And um, uh, we've got our brother, I can say, our master Navi Raju, that is talking about frugal innovation, and he's talking also about our project. He said that we are making a circular economy of knowledge, and of course. There is a lot of patents sleeping uh, in the in the um, in the patent office. Um, I will not take a definition of uh, of, uh, of low tech, but uh, just to say it's a past challenge already. So it's an old story we are talking about. Uh, it's a story about crisis. Uh, we know the earth, uh, the, the world earth catalog. We know the limit of growth, limit to growth. We know the small is beautiful. That is talking about appropriate technologies. So. It's an old story, but now it's perhaps time to, to scale. And uh, I show you some uh, uh, example for um, uh, the project. So we, we take back uh, uh, an old uh, technique that is able to recharge non-rechargeable batteries. And it's an old patent, we take it back. No, it's a called Regen Box. It's a DIY project, but no, the project is changing. Uh, uh, it's a new scale now because we want to run a company and to make something uh, uh, for uh, uh, a regular product for the people. So uh, uh, in hydrogen, uh, in direct combustion, we have a lot of example, old people making this during the second world war, uh, really easily, really quickly, they retrofit a lot of vehicles uh, with uh, so gasogen and hydrogen. Uh, air transportation, it's coming back. 
So the balloon is coming back because it's slow, it's really efficient, and you don't need a lot of infrastructure, of course, because you don't need so much road. You can go uh, under the sea, under the mountain and everything. And also to refreshing the buildings, there is a lot of old product uh, um, uh, coming from uh, Mediterranean. And here there is people, engineers, they are taking back this for the Tour Montparnasse in Paris, for the retrofit of the Tour Montparnasse. And they are using the turbulence of the wind to make uh, ventilation inside the building. So it's um, a project to, uh, to, to follow. And of, the, of course, there is the straw project, the straw buildings, the straw is a, a huge potential to insulate the building and to retrofit. And here you can see on the right, on the left, there is an old building in France. And I know in the United States, there is a lot of old building in straw. So it's a sort of a, a really tradition uh, also in the United States, in some part of the United States. And on the right side, you can see a project where I was uh, interior designer. Uh, it's Eco 46. And it's a project of an administration in Switzerland. And it's project only for, for since five years. There is a dry toilet inside, um, almost uh, zero uh, um, plastic product inside because we, we build everything with the wood in the common. So really local wood, local product um, uh, to be um, um, in maximum resilient. And to finish my presentation, uh, um, we are looking for making a museum uh, because uh, we have a lot of uh, archive now, uh, picture, books, uh, old batteries, uh, stuff like this. And uh, the project of the Retro Future Museum, um, because of the COVID, is, uh, uh, is, uh, is waiting. Uh, but uh, uh, then we decide to make a street project, a sort of open uh, museum in the street. So we make some printings. Uh, with real size people and with QR code, the people, they can scan it and they can make the three dimension, uh, the, 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 uh, the machine appear in the telephone or in the street. So here you can see it's our workshop in Paris. Uh, in front of the workshop, you have different paleo hero and heroine. Uh, you have uh, uh, the people and the big picture and they can scan it and understand. Uh, what is happening. So it's a, it's a part of the, our exhibition system, our transmedia project. Here you can see uh, the, the process, then you can scan the QR code and then it makes the machine upon in 3D. And it comes also because we make a virtual museum because we was in the COVID period. We was not able to uh, welcome the people in the real, uh, in our real place. And then we design, we make 3D modeling and we make a steering engine, uh, uh, hydraulic ram, uh, solar concentration to uh, to 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 melt uh, to melt uh, metals. We make the 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 three D model of the solar printer of uh, of um, our friend uh, Musho. Uh, there is the the Edison car with the nickel iron batteries that was running one thousand miles at. At the beginning of the century, so so it's a really interesting project. Now this project is uh, re uh, uh, innovated by the Delft Institute of Technology also. So there is a really uh, interesting uh, stuff uh, that we exhumated uh, with the with the crowd with the people. And uh, inside the museum, you have some uh, audio guide that is uh, uh, that like, like this. You can uh, you can hear the ghosts talking to you. Uh, and the idea is to make the, the to take the ghost out of the cave, to take this uh, high potential uh, technical out of the cave, and uh, take you for your at attention. And uh, we are always waiting for new invention, new patent, uh, new old patent. Uh, thank you for everything. Thank you so much, Cedric. Um, we are just going to answer a few questions, and then uh, we're going to give you a five minute break. Um, understanding that we have so much to talk about. We'll just take a quick break before we resume. Um, but I do have a few questions that I picked from the chat for our speakers. Um, the first one I have is was for Corentin, um, asking if you could share an example of local entrepreneurship that you found interesting and, and tell us whether you think that example 
might be applicable in a place like France or the US? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so we found many examples, like there are more than 50 and on the platform there are like uh, more than 150. So there are many good examples. And it's true that the examples that are used uh, in rich or poor countries, in countryside and in cities. And let's say, for example, in New York, because we are in New York, we met people that are growing spirulina. You know, spirulina, it's a microalgae that uh, you can eat. It's full of proteins and vitamins and minerals, and you can grow it very easily with a few resources. And it grows in New York, in Brooklyn. And it was, we, we studied that in Madagascar because it was a very uh, great project to um, uh, help people, uh, especially ch children, to, to, eat to eat better. And... Um, yeah, but uh, <laughs> difficult to sum up because there are so many examples. But uh, yeah, about food, we had that. About uh, communication, I was speaking about um, uh, low-tech uh, internet, about uh, energy, biodigester can be used also in, uh, in the cities. And um, yeah, uh, treating water is also like we do it uh, in the boats. Um, doable with um, a phyto, phyto, how do you say, phyto appreciation, like with plants and microorganisms. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so there are many. And you, you can have a look at the um, website lowtechlab.org because there are many other examples. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, this question is for Philippe, um, asking if there are any tools or organizations that you think might help in implementing raw material constraints in industry. You're implementing raw materials, what, sorry? Sorry, if there are any, just any tools um, or, or organizations you would recommend that are helping sort of think about these raw materials and what materials we use in industry um, that might help some of our some of our attendees in thinking about these yes, questions. Okay. So that, I think there are some general resources that maybe we can share in the chat, like US, US Geo, Geophysical Survey, also now the International Energy Agency is a, providing many details on all the, the raw materials that are used in the various uh, energy uh, production uh, systems, so all types of PV uh, solar systems, all types of, uh, of windmills, all types of even hydro, everything is, is really well uh, detailed. And, and I think that more and more uh, uh, companies try to, uh, let's say, have a, an idea of their exposure to, to raw materials, because of course, this, is, this can really be a problem in your, in your in your supply chain and but it's 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 quite difficult for them because uh the production is, is generally based on tier one uh subcontractors and then tier two tier three tier four subcontractors so so it's not it's not so easy for the moment so except the the very general um yes resources i think the british uh geophysical survey is also providing a few resources but generally speaking once we come to the to, in, to the industry it it often becomes uh, uh, secrets business uh, business secrets. So it's it's very difficult to to get access to what what are the right raw materials used in such or such and such device. And coming to uh, to very high tech products, it's also the generations are going so fast that once you have finished the first study, you you are already uh, not really uh, at the point. Yeah. A uh, question for Scott. Um, how can your project be scaled to support a small community? Any um, thoughts on that? Well, my projects are only scaled for small communities. Uh, right. so <laughs> we, we don't advocate for anything um, <laughs> anything on a national scale, right? Because right. Uh, especially in America, everyone's such a rugged individualist uh, national scale things. Are, are difficult. Whereas when you do it in your community it actually works better because you can see the results of it for yourself. It's the potatoes you grew. It's the, the tomatoes you grew. It's the, the corn that you grew, right? So uh, it's, it's, it's easier, I think, on a smaller scale. And so, for example, uh, we did it mostly for our household. But like I said, um, we grew over was over a thousand potato plants because uh, in addition to the food mageddon that we are doing as a study, 
COVID was happening. And I wrote to my family and said, you know, at what point are you going to leave Chicago and come out and stay with us? And they said, well, there's no food in Chicago because we didn't know in the beginning what was going to happen. And so, like I said, we grew thousands and thousands of pounds. And luckily uh, we were able to give it all to the food pantry. Um, and so, mm -hmm. you know, using green spaces, using these spaces around, we could grow a lot, a lot of food locally um, in, and, and, and those are, good on a small community scale, um, parts of parks, par you know, next to roads, places that are green spaces that aren't necessarily being used uh, for, for food production, could be brought into production on a small community scale and you could grow quite a lot of your food, even staples. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess that's a, that's a question I could extend to, the whole, to anyone in the group. You know, um, a lot of the examples that have been discussed are very well suited to small scale, um, small scale situations. Um, you know, thinking about the numbers of people who may really benefit from some of these technologies, do you have any thoughts about, about mindful scaling? And how can we, um, yeah, just how can we, how can we spread these ideas more effectively and keep them sustainable? Philippe, I see you just got on camera. Do you have an answer to that? Yeah, maybe it might. It's a key issue because it's. Quentin uh, was talking about the garage and the, the very sympathetic people making a few things, and it's, it always looks like very yes micro scale. And, and and what we need is of course a, at least a meso scale, something in the middle, or or even a, a macro scale. And think think about let's full full, uh, full uh, systems of uh, energy uh, supply, for instance. So I, I think from my point of view, I think we need some energy. Let's say innovation from let's say yes people like the panelists we've seen and 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 you can inspire people and there can be very interesting very small and micro initiative but at the end i think that the the, the this should be supported by the the public authorities at the end because the only way why 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 do we use so many high-tech things instead of in, instead of low-tech it's because they are quite practical and they are not expensive and they are not expensive because they they can they're, they're content in energy, they're content in greenhouse gases, they're content in, in resources, is, 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 is not counted for real. I mean, they're, 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 it's not valued. I mean, in a smartphone, you have only two euros of, of metals, okay? The 40 different metals that we are spreading out and, and wasting after two years of utilization, it's only two euros. So if there is no value to make it uh, say or be, be, be repaired and, and transmitted to the next generation or whatever for two euros, nobody cares. So there is a mm -hmm. question of, for me, of, of public authorities, which should change the games of the, the, the rules of the game in terms of fiscal mm -hmm. uh, decisions, what should be taxed or not taxed, what should be subsidized, what should be supported uh, in terms of also uh, prescription. I mean, what the public, uh, the public companies, the public... Uh, the, the local authorities and so they buy services, they buy products, and we could in, integrate things to support local initiatives, to support local supply chains, to support the services and products that are less impacting the environment. So, so for me, it's a mix of let's say citizen willingness, maybe enterprise companies' willingness, but I think enterprise is very difficult to to take an initiative if your competitors don't. So. It's better and easier if the public authorities support and change the, ru the, the, the rules of the game, and, mm -hmm. and then all the companies will follow. That's that's a feeling, mm -hmm. but it's maybe too much uh, French centric. <laughs> well, that um, that actually ties into a question I had for Cedric about um, what role the what role patent offices might play. Do you think that there's a there's a role for particular institutions like the patent office to um, to yeah. crowdsource and share innovations? Um, yeah, in yeah, yeah. Of course, because. Uh, uh, to, to protect a patent, it's the it's the it's the states with with doing this. So it's a, it's a public affair. Mm -hmm. So now there's public domain. So the public domain must 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 be re uh, re put in the front of the people because it's it's big is it's it's it belong it belongs to everybody. So it's like a a, a a Pandora box. It's a treasure, and we have to open the treasure. And no, there is the people that, because of the high tech we have now, the digital uh, 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 power, we can uh, we can digitalize all the archive, so it can gives us the the power to take it really like uh, quickly, for the engineering school and for the innovation today for uh, tackle climate change and resources problems. So, mm -hmm. 
I'm, I'm really sure the, the, the data, the patent office have, have a role to play, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um, given that it's 11.15 in Boston, 10.15 in Houston, um, I'm going to um, have us take a short five minute break um, before, we, before we move on to our second set of speakers who are actually, uh, we're already starting to reference some of these innovations that our second set of speakers are gonna talk about um, in the chat to offer some, some very concrete solutions. So please um, take five minutes, um, feel free to continue chatting um, here on Zoom or, or get up from your computer and we'll see you again in five minutes for a few more speakers. Thank you. That's it for this extra long episode. Part two comes next week. The Low Tech Podcast is put out by the Low Technology Institute. At the moment, the show is hosted, edited, and distributed by me, Scott Johnson. This episode was recorded in the Low Technology Institute Institute, uh, as you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, and elsewhere. We hope you enjoyed this free podcast, and if you'd like to join the community and help support the work we do, please consider going to patreon.com slash lowtechinstitute and signing up. The Low Technology Institute is a 501c3 research organization supported by members, grants, and underwriting. You can find out more information about the Low Technology Institute, membership, and underwriting at lowtechinstitute.org. Find us on social media, and you can reach me directly. I'm scott at lowtechinstitute.org. Our intro music was Early Sun, off the album Bittersweet Endings by Crowander. That song is under the Creative Commons Attribution and Non-Commercial License. This podcast is under the Creative Commons Attribution and Share Alike License, meaning you're free to use it and share it, as long as you give us credit. Thanks, and take care. today is if I hold her, if I put her down, she screams. So she got to be on the podcast today and she was very quiet and hopeful. Thank you. <laughs>